Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia and we are here today to sketch another insect with you. I've been chatting with Susan in the chat box and we were talking about sketching a species of tiger moth. Um, I have, I will admit, I do have two species. Possibly three, um, <clears throat> two or three species of tiger moth. I think that this one is really cool because it has this kind of black and white striping on the forewings. Um, there is a little bit, this specimen was collected in, this specimen was collected in 2010. So it's already 13 years old, which means that the pink and the hind wings has faded out a lot. Um, Arcteids are known for having these really bright hind wings, but that, that color is fading pretty good. I also want you to take note while you're looking at it underneath my desk camera that the color is significantly different than what you're seeing in under the microscope. Admittedly, the microscope kind of darkens and vi makes the colors a little bit more vibrant, and that's what it looked like back when it was vibrant, um, but the it's not black and yellow like it may appear. It's more black and white on the front wings, and then um, pink with those black spots. Um, I was actually just going through and pulling out my old notes because I was curious about what the actual characteristics are to um, to define a tiger moth versus other moths. Um, I have always just um, I've always just kind of uh, let's see how do I say it? Generally, uh, tiger moths have very bright hind wings and um, kind of bland front wings. So you can almost know that it's a tiger moth just by looking at the colorations in the wings. But I was hoping that if I found my notes from back when I was doing this, that, yep, I would be able to come up with a defining characteristic. Oh no! My front camera died. Here, give me a minute. Sorry, guys. Luckily, they're connected to two different pieces, so um, we're just going to turn me off for it for a minute, and will bring me back. Where'd it go? That's probably why. All right. I'll be back shortly once I get this up and running again. Um... Oh, how lovely! I think so too, Avea. I think that this is an absolutely beautiful specimen. Um, yeah, the black and white is really cool, and the bright colors are really cool. So, looking forward to sketching this one with you guys. Um, I will admit that I'm not sure of the exact species that this specimen is. I do know it down to genus, but there are a couple of species within that genus in the range that it was collected, and the differences between the individual species, um, from what I could tell from a quick look, was the spotting patterns on the hind wings, and they can vary. So sometimes there are certain species that have more or less spots, but then they vary within, and so it can kind of essentially run this, um, it could be a couple of different things. But I'll get you this, I'll get you the genus on this specimen, which is Appentesis, spelled like this. And we put SP at the end because we know that it is one individual, because we know that it is one species. There's only one specimen, so there's no way it could be more than one species. Um, if we were looking at my short, my small collection of Apentesis uh, tiger moths, um, 
they have a variety of different spot patterns, so it is possible that I have multiple species, which is why I was trying to decide between two and three. Um, but alas, uh, I'm going to pull out a ruler and get us some measurements on, on the wings. I have a clear ruler today, so this should be fun. Uh, here we go. We're going to do it like this. Alright, so if we were doing... Um, if we were looking at and measuring the uh, the wingspan of this moth here, that's funny. It's pretty much exactly four centimeters, almost to the dot. And then if we go the body length, so from the end of the abdomen to the front of the head, not including the antenna. It looks like about 1.7 centimeters. So that gives you some measurements for your journals. Um, these are fairly common moths in my region. Um, these were collected in New Boston, Michigan. So they were collected back home. Um, and they were collected under a UV light. So it was probably back when I was first learning how to black light and just set one up in the backyard. So. It's a, it's a fun memory moth, too, for me. Um, I love specimens that you can pull out and you can think about, you know, where you were when you collected them and what you were doing. And, and then your, how you see those specimens changes over time, too, because, you know, you first collect it in 2010. I didn't even know it to family, but um, it kind of evolves with you, you know? So I think that that's kind of cool. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and write tiger moth on the top of here and epenthesis. You wonder if we get them out west. I could almost guarantee that you get these all over the country because I see them regularly but let me go ahead and check maybe Colorado yep there are species in Colorado and let me go ahead and check California I'm sure that there are they're gonna be different species than the ones that we see in Michigan, but this genus is fairly large. Yes, you have them in California too. Ooh, although um, one or two of the species that you have in California has, um, I'll show this to you. So you can see how this specimen on the hind wings, it would have been mostly pink with some black spots. Um, you have one that's all black with pink colorations in it on the hind wing. And I think that that is really, really super cool. Apentesis ornata. I haven't seen that species yet. I might have to collect more of these tiger moths. I didn't realize that this was a whole genus. Um, Black with pink markings is so stylish. And that's why they call it the ornate tiger moth. The black with pink. Um, so I think that that is super nifty. No problem, Avea. Um, I love doing this. So thank you guys for, thank you ladies for, uh, for showing up every week and hanging out with me and, and talking bugs and sketching. Um, have a look at the police car moth. All right, I will. Um, the other species of tiger moth that I have is the Isabella tiger moth. And I do believe that we have sketched that one in the past. Um, it's the moth of the woolly bear caterpillar. Ooh, the police car moth is beautiful. And I love that it has that, um, that like warning spot when it opens its wings. That's nifty. So, Susan, you had mentioned that your ulterior motive was looking at 
the legs. And looking at it from that direction. And you know, I'll admit, we haven't really turned too many of these over and looked at them from that point of view. But this specimen might be an okay one to do that with because it's a smaller moth. So sometimes the really big moths, I have a hard time with turning them sideways and manipulating them because the wings get in the way and they're so fragile and I don't want to break them. Um, but this one, I probably could stand up without any issue. So, um, I might have to do that. Alrighty, so we're going to go ahead and switch back over to the live camera rather than that picture. So something that you will notice on this specimen is because I did collect it so many years ago, I was not all the way used to spreading moths yet, so you will notice those white spots right here and here through the front wings, and you might even see the holes on the hind wings too, they're going to be a little bit further out I think. Um, I, when I was spreading this moth, I did put the, put a, probably a pin that was a little bit too big uh, through the wings, um, but you know. Uh, it was a learning experience, and I am happy that I started somewhere. Okay. Alright, so I'm, I said 1.7 centimeters long and 4 centimeters in wingspan. So that means our wingspan is going to be approximately double... A little bit less than double. So I'm going to try and get a, get myself a little bit of an outline. I'm trying to make sure that I keep my body small enough that um, it's not going to, the wings aren't going to go off my paper. My wings like to fly off the paper regularly. I had a very cooperative police car moth hanging out on a golden rod for about an hour. Ooh, that's awesome. But it was hard to sketch the legs. That makes sense. We'll go ahead and we'll talk about leg placement. We'll turn it sideways and I'll be able to show you a little bit. Um, these ones don't have, um, these ones don't have the, the brush foot um, like nymphalids do. So the, uh, all three pairs of legs are visible when they're walking around. And you're going to still have that first pair of legs moving forward and the second and third pair of legs moving backwards. But I can understand kind of the, the coxal segments are kind of long on this specimen. So we'll, I, I'll uh, point it out to you a little bit in a little bit. All right, so um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I think where I'm going to start is the head. And keep in mind, the head is itty bitty tiny on a specimen like this. It's right here. This little poof that almost just looks like a little bit of poof of hair, that's actually the entire head. Once you get anywhere past that, this whole section here is the thorax. And you have three segments. So the first segment of the thorax is here, the second segment's here, and the third segment's here. So this one that kind of goes a little bit wider and has is that triangular piece, that's where the first pair of legs are connected and is um, the first segment of the thorax. Now. Um, the first pair of leg, the first pair of wings are also connected to that segment. They just tend to be connected to the very end of that segment. Um, so there's that. Okay, let's go ahead and start this. Let's see. I'm going to make sure that that stays really nice and small because it's small in comparison to the body. And I want to make sure the wings attempt to stay on the paper. Um... So I'm going to start with this little D shape where it's kind of flat on the bottom and rounded up on, on the top. Um, I also want to give everybody the heads up. If there's anybody new out there hanging out and watching, always I always go through and do a very light sketch first, and then we go back through and we darken all of our we darken all of the shapes. So welcome if you are new um, to the very beginning. Um, very good. So the width of the thorax is looking like about three times the width of the head. So if you go out 
from the edge of the head equivalent to its length on both sides, then you will end up with what we want the thorax's, um, what we want the thorax's width to be. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of create this shape here. I want to, I'm just creating the thorax and Uh, we are going to make minor modifications to this, but I'm just going to cut it straight across for now, and then uh, we'll talk about how that's going to change in the future. This is where the wings are connected. And then, if I scooch the specimen up, scooch, 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 there we are. We end up with the abdomen. I'm going to brighten it up just a little bit so that we can see more of that abdomen. Um, so, something interesting that happens with butterflies, but especially large bodied moths, is that when they pass away, um, they tend to have an issue with grease and oil from their bodies kind of leaching out into the hair. So even though this specimen was like a bright pink color when it was alive, um, this specimen, now that it has passed and is part of a collection, is kind of dark and almost shiny. And that's because the oil has kind of leached through the body and made the hair darker. Now, I do believe, let me sketch while I'm talking. Lots of fat packed into that abdomen. Yeah, exactly. A whole lot of fat, a whole lot of oil, a whole lot of grease. And that's why, um... And that's why you have that really dark, kind of shiny look to it. Um, that's not a look that you will have if that specimen was alive. That's why everyone loves to eat them. Oh, that's so funny. Exactly. So let's see. The abdomen does. Um, so when we're talking about moths in general, they tend to have this kind of wider body. But um, it does narrow, so let's see. I'm just going to give it We'll be able to get some of the wings on. This is fine. All right. So we've got a body happening. It is pretty wide. Um, now we do want to add our wings and I pulled it over here just so that we could look at it one more time in its entirety so you can get some of these ratios correct. Um, I can even do this if we want. Let's see. Oh, oopsies. have to turn it around. My camera is inverted on this level. but. Um, if you want, you can screenshot this so that you have an idea of the, um, so that you have an idea of, uh, of all of the proportions. Okay. Now, I'm going to get us, um, I'm going to get us an estimate on our wings here. Uh, we're going to come down to where the thorax is more straight, like this vertical line here, and then we're going to pull it out. Um, we want the wing, one wing, let me see, maybe I'll get a, maybe I'll get a measurement on the one wing. We, I guess we could split it in half. So it's four centimeters of a wingspan. So you're going to have a two centimeters. So you're going to be two centimeters from the center of the body. Probably about 0.3 centimeters. Point 0.2. So your wing is going to be about the same length as your body. That's kind of cool. I like that. All right, so coming out here, I'm curious how long my body is. about five. Okay. So, um, I'm got, I made a little mark on my paper to help me out with that. Um, I'm going to start here from where this, um, the first segment of the thorax ends. That's
that's kind of where we're going to start our wing. We're going to pull it up to that point and then I'm going to round it out just a little bit. Um, when we are sketching a well pinned specimen, the hind, um, the bot, the back side, this side of the front wing is going to make a straight horizontal line across the specimen. So if your body is going up and down, the bottom of the front wings should make a 90 degree angle. Um, that's a well spread moth or a well spread butterfly. Um, if you have many changes, um, if you have many changes in that, then um, it's just not, it's essentially just not as well done. And the left side is going to go off the paper a little bit, but you know, I only going to do the one side anyway, so we're good. All right, now with my specimen here, I am going to sketch it with less of this space here. Maybe I'll show you that under the microscope. So you see how there's that, um, that larger gap there in between the front wing and the hind wing? Generally, nowadays, I don't like to leave that amount of gap in between the front and the hind wing. So I'm going to pull it up a little bit and kind of imagine it more connecting here. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to give myself a little line that comes in and goes out to the length of the front wing. And instead of continuing it around a lot of times, I like to start from the body and move down. So I'm going to come here from essentially right around uh, the bottom of the thorax. And I'm going to pull it almost all the way down to the length of the body, but not quite. Um, the hind wings are not longer than the body. We're going to go about two thirds. And then once you get to that point, you can round it off and kind of connect those two. And that is going to be kind of how we're going to start the shaping on our hind wings. And then we're just going to go ahead and double that up to make sure that your specimen is mostly symmetrical. That's the goal. Because insects do get to be symmetrical. And even though the hind, the spots on the hind wing vary specimen to specimen, generally they are very, very similar the left to the right. When you spread the wings like this, there always seems to be a teeny tiny bit of overlap. Would it ever make sense to spread the four wings higher so you can see the upper edge of the hind wing? That is a fantastic connection to this page. Um, something that I always found really tricky about tiger moths is that one of the characteristics to determine that it's a tiger moth is right there where you don't get to see on the hind wing. Maybe on this side. So, um, butterfly and moth, um, butterfly and moth wing venation was not always my favorite. I will admit that. I'll show you my diagrams. <laughs> um, here we are. So, when we're looking at Arcteids, Maybe I will switch over to our table camera. Okay. Oh no! The magic! Okay. Um, so when we're talking about Arcteids, anyway, Arcto means bear, which is kind of fun. So the scientific name is like, 
It, it, it refers to being a bear, and I've always wondered if it was because they were fluffy or why they were the why why bear. But um, <clears throat> you have a couple of you have a couple of characteristics that all Arcteids have in common. My personal note was that there's a lot of times bright colors in the abdomen, but that is not always the case. Also, the hind wings generally are brightly colored. Not always the case. So the front wing with um, these veins down here appear to be four branched. I made sure to put these spots on it. So when we look at the wing venation, we'll see that off of this, off of this cell here, there's going to be four branches that come off kind of the bottom half of this cell. That's one characteristic. The other characteristic, and you talked about, see, I, I even used this spe specimen as an example. Um, the other characteristic is right here on the um, subcoastal cell. Um, and it is, this is the hind wing. So this is an area that would definitely be covered by the front wing when it's pulled up like that. And um, ideally, we're supposed to be able to see this kind of little half vein that comes up off of this cell. That is a super tricky one to see. Um, but let's see if we can find it. C, does CU stand for cubitus? You know what? I'm going to look it up really quick. Cubitus sounds right, but it's the one that I always, it's the one that I always forget, forgot, so I wanted, yes, CU does stand for cubitus, uh, and you did spell it right, awesome, so A stands for, um, A stands for, uh, the anal veins, then you've got the cubitus, the medial veins, and the, is it radium, radial, Radius. So R are the radius veins, and then SC stands for subcosta. You're so good, Avea. I'm proud of you. Yeah, R is radius. <laughs> yes, yeah, subcoastal is that's exactly how it's spelled. All right, so I think that this is it. While we're talking about the wing venation, um, this vein that you can almost kind of see that comes through right around here and then goes down and then splits here, and then you see this one and this one, and then it kind of comes back. That is your, that's kind of that cell in the hind wing. And if you look really close, right about here coming all the way back to maybe connecting right around here that is the vein that they're talking about <laughs> and that is how you determine that a moth is an arcteid or a tiger moth um so <laughs> it's a little tricky to see um and it's definitely not something that you're going to be able to see when the specimen is flying around um If Arctos is because bears like to eat them, I wouldn't think so, but I, <laughs> I'm not sure. The family name is also generally, um, the family name is based on the first spe species that 
is collected and identified in the group. So, um, I believe maybe it's not Arctos. Arctini, Arctini. Arctos. I'm not sure what the first best species that was collected in Arctiidae was. Um, but like, I know in Swallowtails, it's Papilio, which is why the family name is Papilionidae. Um, so my guess is that there is an Arctiid um, or an Arctos uh, genus that sounds very similar. I'm just not sure which one it is. See my earlier comments. So now I'm wondering if Arctos is because bears like to eat them. I don't know, Susan, I missed your earlier comments, but I want to keep drawing. Cool. So, I'm glad we got to go on a little side journey, and we also now have a, a fairly decent outline of kind of what's happening on this specimen. So, we are going to zoom in a little bit and get this party started. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. All right. So this specimen, I was going to say this when we were looking at it. Let's see, other light. Maybe, maybe more light. It has these two darker spots right here um, on the first segment of the thorax that almost makes it look like eyes, and I wonder if that's a defensive mechanism. Um, you can't really see the compound eyes very well because it's so cetos, um, or it's so fluffy. All right, uh, so what I'm going to do is just kind of start darkening some of these outlines I'm happy with. Um, I'm going to start with the head here. It does still appear like that is a fairly straight line, although when I add um, the rest of the head, instead of just making it like this, um, I'm going to follow that outline, but I'm going to create these very small lines that all go up in that direction to kind of make it look nice and fluffy. All right, so instead of making it that solid line, I'm going to kind of make it look cetose, make it look kind of fluffy by just following that line and going in that direction, maybe even maybe even throughout. Sure. Now, the uh, the the antenna are bipectinate. All right, they are bipectinate. Bi meaning two, pectinate meaning comb shaped. Um, so you'll see that on one side it looks like a comb, on the other side it looks like a comb. Sometimes people will mistakenly call moth antenna a plumose because when they think of the moth's antenna, they think of a feather. And plume and feather kind of go together. But those are two different types of antenna. So a uh, bipectinate antenna, you've got pieces coming off of both sides, but they are on one plane, all right? Whereas on a plumose antenna, this would be like um, midges and mosquitoes. Their, um, their antenna, it comes off on multiple planes, and it looks like a big, like a wire brush. So they have individual segments, and then they have um, hairs that are radiating from those segments. Um, whereas bipectinate is flat and on one on one plane. 
like this. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this guy started. Uh, it looks like the antenna could go about as long as half of the length of the wings. So I'm gonna go ahead and get, let's see. Woo! That looks about right. And um, the center of the antenna are actually fairly thick for antenna. So I'm just gonna double it up here and just make it nice and thick. And then try and make it similar on the other side because I like when the antenna match. Obviously when uh, this moth is flying around its antenna aren't going to match. It's going to be going all over the place. So you don't have to make them match. I like it when they do. It makes me smile. Plumos antenna look like wild matter or world loose strife. Yes! They have whorls in them. That's the word. I was like, there's a plant word for this type of leaf arrangement. Yeah, it's like their world, for sure. I was going to say it, but I couldn't remember the word for it. So thank you, Susan, for, um, for, for helping us out. And with bipectinate antenna, when you have one on one side, you always have one on the other side. So they are always opposite. Uh, you never have an alternate branching on bipectinate antenna. So however many um, pieces you put on the left, ideally you put that same number on the right. Um, this bipectinate antenna almost looks funny because at some point in the bottom they kind of curl up and they look like they almost connect to one another, but they are all individual and they're all separate. They're just like hooked a little bit coming down. And you know what? When we zoom in on that antenna like this, it reminds me of a spine. Cool. Now I want an insect with little yellow flowers hanging off of it. That's really cute. Yeah, exactly. So um, moths are well known for having bi these like bipectinate antenna, um, but they're not all big and floofy like the big Saturnids, like the male Luna moths and the male um, Isle moths and those types of things. Um, although the, um, the pieces of these antenna are pretty distinct in comparison to sometimes you have sphinx moths that even though they have bibectinate antenna, they just look like really thick antenna because the pieces are, are wide and kind of really close together. We're going to call that, all right. Okay, there, now I can see the eyes. I rotated the specimen just a little bit because I was curious. We can see the compound eyes from this point of view. They exist right here, kind of behind the antenna. So what we could do is kind of darken two spots off to the left and the right. I'm okay with adding the antenna in there. Um, but now that we are looking at it this way, it doesn't look as angular. I'm going to make it rounded more up here. And at this area, you can also, at this view, you can see those two spots I was talking about that almost look like eyes in the, um, in the CD of the thorax. So I'm just going to make this kind of nice and wide and happy. And then I'm going to scooch. Scooch, scooch. Okay. Um, in moths, a lot of times, uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, when you spread the moth wings, sometimes you'll have kind of these clumps of um, these clumps of hair or these clumps of CD that kind of stay together and widen up a little bit. That is the same with this specimen. We have this piece here, and then we have this piece here, and I honestly think that they are connected to some type of flight muscles underneath. 
Um, but I don't have an answer, so maybe one day we will have an answer to that one. Um, for what, what I'm going to do now is just create those triangle, triangular pieces here. Um, so I'm going to kind of imagine that they look a little bit like this. They go the full length of the thorax. The scapulars on birds, those would be the scapular feathers. Oh, cool. Is scapulars a moth word? I believe you. I mean, that's really cool. I love it. Awesome. So I gave myself a little bit of an outline, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back in and kind of make it fluffy by creating all of these little short lines that run this way. I don't know if it's a moth word, but that is the term for birds. Cool. So the scapular feathers on birds are the ones that are on the back, like at the shoulder blades. All right, so we've got those taken care of. I am going to make them a little shorter up here because I want to add those black spots here and here. And then we have these darker regions on the center of the scapulars here and here. That's what we're going to call them for now until we come up with the actual moth term. But I'm happy with scapulars for now. Cool. And isn't the scapula our sh isn't the scapula a bone that we have? It is the flat triangular shaped bone known as the shoulder blade? Cool. Awesome. So um, at this point, I have these darker, I have these darker regions here on what seem to be very similar to scapula. Um, we've got the dots up, the spots up here. Uh, what I want to do is not create this straight line across, but you'll notice that it's kind of the thorax, the end of the thorax is a little pointed. So I'm just going to take it, make sure that I fall down that center line, and then kind of bring it down a little bit, like so. Can I tell you guys something? You're really going to appreciate this. I actually have it sitting here. Maybe. I thought I had it sitting right here. Oh, there it is. So, um, this is really cool because um, my mother... <laughs> Uh, is, she has a really large garden, and so she mailed me veggies from her garden, and they include, like, cucumbers and zucchini and cherry tomatoes and, um, green beans and sweet pods. Anyway, she left me a note, and she gave me a letter, and the letter is a John Muir, has a John Muir quote on it. I was like, she knows me so well. And so it says, in every walk with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. And I just thought that that was so sweet that she gave that to me. So. <coughs> oh, ready. Uh, we're looking at the abdomen. If we try really hard to count, if we try really hard to count um, these abdominal segments, we might be able to do it. Although up here at the top, where that triangular piece is, it might be a little difficult because of the hair. Let's see: one, two, three, four, five, six, with a possible seven. That's what I'm looking at. One, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, possibly seven, depending on how fluffy the ab abdomen is. So, um, 
what we're going to do is we already have an outline of how long we want it to be. So I want to kind of subdivide it into the segments. And then we're going to um, we're gonna darken some of these lines. So let's see. I'm going to add, lightly add some of this fluff here first. There we go. Let's see. <laughs> One. Two. Three, four. One, two, three, four. Five is like mostly triangular. Five like this. And then I'm seeing six, instead of it being so pointed, is more flat and round. More like this. And then it kind of poofs out from there. So that's kind of how I'm going to subdivide my abdomen. And then what I'm going to do is between every segment, I'm going to add parentheses so that it almost looks like the moth is like that. You know, it's bulging a little bit at the edges. So we're going to come out like this and we're going to pull it across. And then we're going to come out and add a little bit of these parentheses. Um, they don't need to tuck into one another like a wasp would. Um, I know we've worked a good amount on doing kind of the wasp, the uh, shaping in the wasp abdomens, but um, with these moths, uh, they just kind of bulge at the segments rather than kind of stacking and folding into themselves. Um, Arcteids generally, um, you're gonna laugh at me, but Arcteids, it's funny, um, they generally do have three spots along their body. They're gonna have lateral dots on either side and then they have medial spotting in the center. So you'll see if we look, if you look really closely, you'll see these kind of darker spots here along the edge. He does have the same ones on the other edge. And it doesn't matter if you're looking at this genus or if you are looking at a leopard moth or if you're looking at an Isabella tiger moth, they all have these dark spots on the medial sides, on the median and then the lateral. Sometimes they are more defined. This one is a little bit less defined, so I'm just going to kind of add those stripings down the middle and then down the sides and kind of have them meet up at the end. I think that that's going to make it look really nifty. Um, I'm going to catch up on our chats. Let's see. Really liking the, the feather groups. Cool. That's cool. I get to learn all the precise detail and then in the field I don't try and get all that detail. That makes sense. I love that. Yeah, because we can we can dive deep into whatever you guys want when we're looking at him under a microscope for sure. <laughs> Alrighty, so I think it's about time to try some of this wing patterning. And I will admit that I am not 100% feeling drawing all of the wing venations. So I just want to draw the really cool pretty pattern. So let's do that today. And um, if you greatly disagree and you really, really want to focus and zoom in and see some of that wing patterning, I will do that for you. Um, <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. I'm, um, I don't know. Working too much, I guess. My body is trying to say, we're going to give you a cough so that you stop working so hard. Um, so something that I am noticing about this moth right now is that we had originally, I had originally kind of pulled this down straight and the, um, the top of the wing is a little bit longer than the bottom. So as you're curling it back around, make sure that that line kind of reaches a little bit towards the body. And then you don't want any of the corners. It's a very, very round, um, very round shaped wing. I'm gonna get this better in focus. I'm sure that there's a better focus for this guy. There we are. That's way better. Okay. 
Sorry, guys. I think I can tell when I need to clean my glasses. Because it's like, oh, is that in focus? <laughs> Are there spiracles there on the sides? Caterpillars would have spiracles there, but I'm not sure how the adults breathe. Yes! The, um... They do have spiracles along the edges of the abdomen, um, along the sides of the abdomen. But because of all the hair, I don't know if I've ever seen a butterfly or moth spiracles. They do have them. And they are along the abdomen, not in the thorax or anywhere else. Um, but I'm not exactly sure if I've ever seen them. When these guys fold their wings, the forewing completely hides the hind wing. Yes and yes. Um, when they when they close up, they definitely are going to be completely covering it. Um, and I guess that also depends on like what resting state they're at. So I, I'll go ahead and give you two quick examples. So you've got bloop bloop bloop. Um, and then like a thoraxy region. And sometimes the moths, when they are completely closed, you still, um, this isn't a moth, this is a quick sketch, so I'm um, sorry about the not equal lines. Um, but sometimes when the wings are closed, they close like this over the body. And then um, you can see both left and right wings. There are some moths that they stack their wings on top of one another, but these ones don't. These ones rest their wings together like this. But regularly, I'm going to add the antenna. It looks weird without them. Um, but regularly, when these guys land, and if they're in kind of this active mode, instead of landing like this, I regularly see these moths landing more that you understand what I'm going for. Um, landing more like this. Where they cover up their abdomen, but you can still kind of see those hind wings a little bit. And it's kind of funny because the hind wings are smaller than the front wings, so I'm going to be erasing this and making it a lot shorter. Um, but uh, when they're open like this, you could almost create one equal U going all the way across the body. Um, so those are kind of two resting stages of these moths. And a lot of times when they're like this, they're also shivering. Like they, uh, their wings are pumping really, really quickly. They almost are like vibrating. And sometimes they vibrate like that to kind of warm up their muscles before they fly again. Um, so they'll sit there and kind of vibrate. But yes, this way they would completely hide their hind wings, and this way they would see a little bit of the hind wings. All right, I'm going to go ahead and darken. I'm pretty happy with the outline of this now that I've rounded it out and made it a little bit angled in and rounded it all out. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get the, the darker outline of the bottom wing, too, before I start adding some of these designs. So I'm going to pull this down. I'm happy with the length, um, but you'll notice that the... scales on the hind wings not only are on the hind wings but they are off of the edge so if you look at the edge of the hind wing the hind wing almost looks fluffy and that's because it is <laughs> those um those scales on the wings are on the very edge and they're making it look super fluffy something like that I'm happy with it. 
Okay, so uh, let's see. On our front wing, the leading edge of the front wing has a very, very narrow, dark line. So I'm just going to make sure that up here... has a nice kind of a darker line here and um, I find it easier to pick one color and outline that so I'm going to choose to outline the dark the black spaces and then fill them in so we have that one very long rectangle the one with the hole in it admittedly and it's going to I'm going to mark it it's going to go up to right around here that's a fairly long um, color we're going to come up Okay. All right. And from this point, um, what I want to do is I'll go all the way to the edge. So I'm going to see what it looks like in this upper part of our wing. So I'm going to pull it down from here to create that this angle, but we're not going to touch this space because you've got that little bit of a white line in between these two shapes. It angles out almost to the edge of the wing and then back and this whole shape is darkened okay and then up here you also kind of have I've always imagined this guy it looks like a check mark um, but I'm going to cut the corner of this wing off and I'm going to darken right in there too. And you know what? It's already starting to look realistic, so that's cool. Um, if you follow this angle, you skip a little bit and make it a little bit steeper. We're going to take this all the way to the edge and then follow it parallel to here and we create that check mark. And we're going to fill this in dark. Um, are CD just long scales? Are scales just short, flat CD? Or are they fundamentally different structures? They are fundamentally different structures. Um, CD are hairs. They exist on the body of the moth. Um, scales have different functions. Uh, their function is color and um, heat dispersal um, across the wing. Um, but you do have, I think they call them hair-like scales. I think is what I've seen in text, is that they have hair-like scales, but they still consider them scales and not hair covering the wing. Good question. I love your attention to detail, Susan. And yes, um, the, the scales are what we see on the wings, and the CD are what we see on the body. I'm trying to think if there are any examples of actual hair on the wings of a specimen. And the only one that I can think of are, you're going to laugh at this, are trichopterans. I believe they're, they have actual hair on their wings. And I believe trico means hair, and terra means wings. Um, everything else that I can think of has scales. All right, at this point, 
Let's see. I want to... I'm going to add the little triangle here at the edge. We're almost there to the, um, to the very bottom of our wing. So just making sure that you leave that little bit of space here. Ooh, you don't know Trichoptera! The um, common name for those are caddisflies, which you probably know. I was... Caddisflies? Do you recognize that? Because if not, we can definitely draw a caddisfly next time. That could be fun. I think this is in the wrong angle. I want this instead of going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that one for now. Um, which is the next one I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do the long bottom dark piece here. That center triangle is kind of messing with my head, so I'm gonna do some things around it so that I can base something off of it. Um, so I'm gonna take this space here And I'm going to run it along the bottom. Just make sure you leave some of that white there. And then it does go up and then come back down and dark. So, some of my best friends are caddisflies. I love it. Um, yeah, so Trichoptera is the, is the order for caddisflies. Um, I could be wrong, all right? But if I was just going to throw a guess out there into the ether about the fringe-like scales on the ends of the moth wings, I would imagine that while they are flying, they are kind of like blowing in the wind this way. Um, and also, these are night flying creatures. So, they are trying to avoid bats. And I would throw out a guess that those scales, though that like fringed scales on the edges, might mess up the bat sonar. That's my guess. Alright, so it gets a little weird down here, and I was trying to make it... I think that what happened is this one's a little bit long. And then... Yeah, that's better. Alright, so that's what I'm going to leave for our front wing design. It's got the cool check mark shape. It's got that funky little triangle in the center. All right, let's check out some hind wings. Now, on both sides of the hind wings, you have that hooked dark space, and you have that spot that's actually connected. But lots of tiger moths are day flying, aren't they? And butterflies have the fringe too. You make a good point. This specimen is night flying. The Isabella tiger moth is night flying. I. I'm sure that there are day flying tiger moths out there, but the ones that I can think of off of the top of my head right now are night flying. Every now and again, but they're also, okay, so tiger moths are also a little bit lazy in that um, if I set up a black light, I'm gonna just gonna go ahead and give you a bug example. If I set up a black light, and I had it running all night, and I brought in lots of moths and lots of beetles and all types of things, and then at the end of the night, I turn off the light and I go to bed. In the morning, I wake up, generally what's left on the sheet from the night before is going to be like some of the bigger scarab beetles, they like to stick around, and then tiger moths. So, 
Maybe they are night flying, but readily seen during the day because they just stay wherever they landed. Unless you are seeing them actually flying around. I was trying to buy police car moss flying all over last week. Oh, cool. I wonder if it changes the sound. I wonder if the sound is different. Maybe they fly lighter. That's a really kind of cool thought that I hadn't considered. Do you know if colors at nighttime work similarly to colors underwater? Do certain colors disappear faster in the dark on land too? I am not sure. I wish I had an answer for you, Avea. I... I don't have an answer for that one. That's a really cool thing to think about. Um, do certain colors disappear faster in the dark? Fascinating question. I have to imagine that it depends on the eye that's looking at the colors because we all have the different nighttime animals. They have different size devices, and so they're going to be taking in different amounts of light. Um, and if they if they have huge eyes and they're taking in lots of light, even though there isn't a lot of light outside, they almost can magnify it and then maybe see all the colors instead. Like I imagine cats have crazy eyesight at night, um, even though it's dark. Whereas some other things may not. But I imagine in humans, there are colors that disappear first, right? So if I'm walking around at nighttime, um, I'm not going to be able to differentiate like two different colored blues, but a white color or a yellow color. I think I can see probably for a longer amount of time because they're kind of brighter. I don't know if that works. But also in humans, the colors of your eyes also determine how much light that they can take in. Or at least that's what I've heard. Um, that uh, people with blue eyes tend to be able to see more colors at nighttime than people with brown eyes. So I guess it not only depends on species, but it also varies by individual characteristics of the eyes. I'm going to try very carefully to turn this moth on its side so that we can see some legs. Okay, look at how adorable its face is. Let's just give let's just give some love to this. Oh, the wings a little bit in the way. Look at how cute she is.
I love it so much. Makes me wonder about color. Maybe there are creatures with specialized eyes. Oh, that's so true. How cool is that? He told me that some insect eyes change in death. Cool. So now I understand why you were having difficulty seeing where the legs are connected and how the coxie are connected because it's all just floof. They just wouldn't hold still. All right, so. And they were crawling. So were they, were they crawling with their wings open or were they crawling around with their wings closed? thinking that if you have a thorax and then your head is kind of smallish, the first coxie is going to exist right around here and then you have the second and the third coxie and then the femurs always connect to the bottom of those. Um, and the first femur is going to go forward and down. The second one goes backwards and down. And the third one going to goes backwards and down. But this would be kind of at rest. They would sit kind of with their legs kind of tucked up like that. But I guess if they were actively walking around... You're right, that might be a little bit trickier. I would have to be sitting there observing it with you to kind of define how the joints were working because that's one that I haven't practiced yet in person. You got to see all the different angles. I mean, that's really cool. And I'm sure that you, uh, I'm sure that you took some pictures, right? So maybe you can work off of the pictures a little bit. So I'm glad that 
we got to talk a little bit about legs and about how they sit with their wings and really get a detailed sketch of the coloration. Um, you know, if you wanted, this is going to be the wing venation of this specimen. Um, there might be like small changes in it, but um, this is what it's going to look like for most Arcteids. Uh, wing venation in butterflies and moths is a family characteristic. So to get past family, you have to use other characteristics, but that's going to be what you use here. Um, so that's a little fun, fun factoid. Viewing the underside directly, the coxie sort of met in the middle, and it took me ages to figure out that the femurs had to connect there at the middle, not the other end of the coxie on the outside. Yes! That is a good point. So, if you weren't looking at it from a lateral point of view, if you're looking at it like it's walking away from you, the body is going to be kind of shaped like this, and the coxy do, they wrap around like this, and then the femur comes out and down. Femur tibia tarsi. So that also could have been kind of messing with things because the because the legs are always connected to the bottom of the coxa, not not really the top. Uh, that gives better like that's that's for muscle movement. That looks funny. And then in some beetles, I'm going to go ahead and draw you some, um, in some beetles, if you're looking at the hind coxa, not always the fore and the, the, the pro or the meso, meso but the metacoxy, um, the hind ones, sometimes they're coxal plates instead, and they're shaped like this where there's kind of this central point, but there's these really kind of wide coxal plates, and then the hot, and then the femurs connect right directly here at the center. The one that I'm, can, that I'm thinking of at the moment are diving beetles. Diving beetles, um, because they're using this center, these hind legs to kind of swim and push off of center, um, they're going to have these long legs that connect to the very center of their body. You know, they're so small. If you were, um, if you wanted to add a trochanter to this drawing right here, it would likely be just like a little triangle right here at the base. It would look like, it would look like a little slice of pizza that turns the angle of your leg. Let's see if I can get this camera to focus. Focus. Really? There we are. So, um, it would be like a little slice of pizza here, and that's where the femur comes up out of. It, um, you're, it's not going to be very big at all. It's practically not going to be visible while the specimen is flying around. I was thinking about the coxal plate. Oh, cool. Good. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I love that, um, uh, I love that you all, like, take all of this a step further, and you're always pushing me to be better, too, and I really appreciate that. And now I have all types of questions about colors, um, at night, and how they see each other, and the reason of the fringe. I know there are entomologists that have answers to those questions, so I'm going to have to go and see if I can find them. 
All right. Um, I think I'm going to be signing off for the night. It's almost 11.30, and I have had an incredibly long day. Um, I hope that you all... Oh, wait a minute. Ah, there we are. Perfect. Oh, my camera is in the, in the shot. My camera never gets in the shot. Eh. That's fine. All right, so um, I hope that you all had a wonderful day. Honestly, I did, um, talking about tiger moths and their flight patterns and their legs and all of this. Thank you so much. Um, as always, I teach on OutSchool, too. It's that little symbol way up there if you are interested in taking, if you have kids that are interested in taking my classes, um, you can find a link in the description that'll give you $20 for free towards classes. So um, that can be up to two free classes for your student, so that's exciting. Um, make sure to subscribe to my channel. All of you out there who are chatting with me, I thank you so much. It's so very important um, to continue to share the love of bugs. It's so much fun. I, um, I am at Insectopia 2015 on both Facebook and Instagram. Um, I haven't posted in a little bit of time. Social media is not my forte, but you know, I am still working on it. I am a work in progress. Um, my email is Trisha at theinsectopia.com if you want to share your sketches or if you want to share a, share a bug picture or if you want to share anything else, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me. And that little QR code there and the little descript, there's a link in the description box below, um, of my PayPal if you were curious and you wanted if you had so much fun and you wanted to donate to my channel, that just helps me buy more pins. I got new pins in today, guys. I was really excited about it. Um, it goes towards it goes towards education, um, feeding my live animals too, um, and just essentially keeping my keeping Insectopia um, an education a small education business up and running. So I really super duper appreciate all that you guys have have already done. Um, I meant to ask that things work out on the Wild Wonder calendar. I believe so. I mean, when I go to the Wild Wonder calendar, I can see all of the other, all of the events, and I can see my events. So I'm hoping that everybody else can see my events. Um, but if, um, oh yeah. Um, if you check the Wild Wonder calendar and I'm not on there, let me know and I will see what else I can do because I'm not exactly sure how to change it. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your week. Next week I will be bringing specimens that are pinned and spread so that you can see them. Um, and... We will talk stories of Arizona because I have a whole bunch of them. But we got talking about tiger moths today, which is also pretty fun. So have a wonderful rest of your week and stay buggy.